Shalom, everyone. And the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Welcome to the seminar today on the observances of Yahuwah. This is going to be really exciting. It's good for old and young and new and old people, people that have been into it for years or just loving this. And it's, uh, it's going to be about the observances or the Moedim or the festivals, the family picnic every, uh, every uh, well, there's three times in a year when we're to meet together. All males over 20 years old are required to meet. And uh, we're going to study those well, there's actually seven different observances, and they all involve a reflection or a reflect or a shadow of the redemptive qualities of Yahushua's activities for his wife. Now, here's the uh, seminar t terminology we're going to use today. The people that are new here, uh, and, and some of you who are old and may not recognize every little nuance, but this is uh, for those watching this on DVD or whatever, they can just slow this down or put it on still and study it. But uh, the word Lord is not going to be used because that's a traditional term and it doesn't reflect anything except the Hebrew word B A A L. That's not good. So uh, the definition of B A A L is a, is a word you should look up in Webster's dictionary. It means Lord. But the authentic Hebrew terms we're going to use are Yahuwah and Yahusha or Yahushua, which means Yah is our deliverer. And we're going to use the word Mashiach or Messiah and El or Elohim instead of G-O-D because G-O-D is the proper name of a solar deity. Just look that up in an encyclopedia. Anyway, the tribe we know of today we call Jews are really the descendants of this fellow named Yehuda. So they're called Yahudim, and it means worshipers of Yah. And instead of calling ourselves by a Greek term, we're gonna call ourselves by the authentic term used in Acts 24 verse five, Natsurim, that's a plural. And it means branches, guardians, watchmen. And you should look up Jeremiah or Yermiyahu 31 verse six to find that term because we're going to cry out on the hills of Ephraim in the last days. In Acts 24, verse 5. And Yisrael is a word that actually is a name given to Yaakov, and it is a, a term that is used for all the tribes that descend from this man, Yaakov. And those are people who are living in the covenant, the ones that are not of this tribe, uh, or of the tribes that don't fall into the category of being observant of the covenant are broken off branches and they need to re-engraft. The Nazarene or the guardians or the watchmen, that's what we are, we're followers. The first and original followers of Yehusha of Nazareth were called Nazarene. And we're the branches and he's the root. Now here's a quick look at the name of the creator because we guard the name and the Torah. That's what Nazarene do. We're guardians, we're watchmen. We guard the name and we guard the Torah. Yod, He, Ua, He. Those are the four letters. That's modern Hebrew and this is the original Hebrew. And it's from Luke 11 that we see, you know, the, the, in the prayer, Kodesh be your name. Your will be done on earth. And that's in the disciples' prayer, you know, which we should do. Our Abba, who is in Shamayim, Kodesh be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on Aretz as it is in Shamayim. Give us this day, or this Yom, our daily Lekem. And forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the honor forever and ever. Amen. Now, that was Luke 11. Now, we're to observe, do, and obey. If you read the brother of Yahushua, who really half-brother, had the same mother, different fathers, we have Yaakov, we call him James. In, in chapter 1, we see him saying this, Therefore, put away all filthiness and overflow of evil, and receive with meekness the implanted word. Notice that word, receive. Because the Torah was given at Sinai, but it wasn't received until the record we see in Acts chapter 2. That's when it was received. Which is able to save your lives and become doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror for he looks at himself and goes away and immediately forgets what he was like. But he that looked into the perfect Torah, that's the instructions, that of freedom, and continues in it, not be, becoming a hearer that forgets, but a doer of work, this one shall be blessed in, the doing, in his doing of the Torah. Now our consciences are programmed uh, from birth by whatever we're taught by our parents and the spiritual leaders and so forth. And it bears witness of our true desires. Now when we hear or read the word of Yahuwah, which is the thing we're celebrating all the time, and we don't and we actually want to do it, and that's our desire to do what we're reading, then what we have is eyes of light. We're looking into the word and we're panting for obedience. Now when we hear or read the word of Yahuwah and our desire is to not do what we're reading because we've been misprogrammed and said, well, that's not for you. That's not for you. Who's putting those thoughts in your mind? Well, the adversary. You don't want to obey that. It's like that uh, thing they do in Star, Trek, uh, Star, in Star Wars. You don't, you don't want to bother these people. You know. Well, <laughs> the Jedi. What we hear or read in, in, that, in that sense, and we don't do it, then we have eyes of darkness because we're looking for other texts that give us permission to disobey. Okay? So we are to obey the following covenant that we're about to read. Let's see how your conscience is programmed to respond to these words. This is the retelling of the covenant for the lost tribes, or the scattered tribes, of Israel in the last days given at Deuteronomy 5. Number one, I am Yahuwah your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah your Elohim to ruin, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. He said it twice. Cast is the Hebrew word nasa, which means to throw. And the word ruin there is the Hebrew word shoah, which means utterly lay waste. Number four, guard the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day, to set it apart as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you. Now, it's funny because we, he says, remember the Sabbath day, and it's the one that they forget. Six days you labor, and you shall do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. 
Number five, respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. And continuing right along with that, hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart. You shall impress them upon your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And then Colossians 2, we see a, a point of view here. Let no one therefore judge you in eating or in drinking or in respect of a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of what is to come for the body of Messiah. Now the word in respect there means in observance of, in observance of a festival or in observance of a new moon or in observance of a Sabbath. Okay, not that we can all have different opinions about that. In other words, these shadows are outlines or frameworks, profiles, silhouettes, forms or likenesses or models. They don't, they're just shadows of something that's to come. Now, they're shadows of redemption. Okay, that's what they really are. And they're for the body of Mashiach. And that body is only one body. And it's called, in scripture, it's called Yisrael. That's the body and the, the bride or the wife. And these are feasts or celebrations or appearances or observances. And we have one that comes every seven days. You know, In fact, before the moon was created, we had the beginning of the week. The foundation upon everything is of all creation is the week. It's not the sun and it's not the moon. The foundation is the week and it, the, the pattern of the seven days is in every culture on the earth and anyway another word in Hebrew for these feasts is kog or chag and it means feast or festival or banquet because a festival is a feast and it's a banquet or a family party a community party and it's for his people and a moed is another Hebrew word that we're going to look at we'll look at these again so you won't have to remember this but a moed is an appointed time. It, so a moed would be a, a particular time that you're to recognize. You're not doing anything necessarily, but you're, it's mostly what you're not doing. You're recognizing or observing that time passing. So when that event comes, something's supposed to trigger in your mind. And what is supposed to trigger in your mind is what Yahuwah has done for you because it's his redeeming that's going to save us. And here's what we call them observances of Yahuwah and they're given to his wife Israel their feasts or festivals or family gatherings and wherever two or three are gathered in his name he is there they're like community bar barbecues now his redemption plan is hidden in these seven events and uh, the, they're agricultural in nature in order to give an example to us. So these agricultural shadows are all about planting and harvesting. But it's not about necessarily what you're reading about. It's not about the barley, it's about something else. It's pointing to something else, even though he's using those as examples. So each observance is associated with a redemptive act of Yahuwah for his wife because he is the redeemer of Israel. It isn't anything we're doing that's saving us. It's about us recognizing what he's done and we observe those things. And we accept it. We receive it. Now, people are like, it's like we're all on a bus ride when we're born on this planet. 
and we're on a tour and it's leading to nowhere except the lake of fire. You know, that's basically where we were all heading at one time. We've all jumped off that bus, those of us that have, you know, acquired the uh, guidance from Yahusha to get off that bus. And after learning that this tour bus we're riding on was all a fantasy or a magical mystery tour. So the true observances that reveal our redemption were not only abandoned, but those who practiced them were hunted down and killed by decree for many centuries. And that's what history is a record of. We were hunted down and we were overcome, all of our ancestors. The dragon had poured out a flood to pursue the woman. The woman is the wife, it's Yisrael. The woman is his bride. Now, in these last days, there's a restoration occurring now that will culminate in the return of Yahushua because he said, well, in the book of Acts, it's revealed to us that these, all of these things have to be restored and he has to stay away until they're restored and then he will return. Yahuwah willing and only by his spirit will closely examine the importance and significance of Yahuwah's commanded festivals, his redemption plan for his bride. In Revelation 12, it says, and out of his mouth, the dragon, the serpent, spewed water like a river after the woman to cause her to be swept away by the river. Now that can be physical or spiritual wormwood because see the wormwood are the false teachings and when you've got poisoned water or false doctrines flowing into the world, that's what the dragons used. And we have to overcome that because overcomers will study the word and be able to overcome. Studying the word, we see things like Yahushua is always saying, it is written. That's the, that's the sword. You know, what's written is our sword. In, in, in the book of Yahushua, or Joshua as they call it in chapter 1, do not let this book of the Torah depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you guard to do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous and act wisely. Now Yahushua observed all these weekly Sabbaths that we know that the Jewish people observe now. The Christians changed it, of course, you know, by Constantine's orders. But uh, the day that Yahuwah blessed was the seventh day of the week. And he, Yahushua observed all these weekly Sabbaths, as well as the annual appointed times, or the Moedim. He often said, it is written, when he referred to Torah, the instructions to live by. Now, I'm going to ask you all this question. Where is it written that we may use unclean animals for food? Or that we may use sacraments to receive Yahuwah's approval or affect our standing before him? Where is it written? Or where is it written that we may... <laughs> that the seventh day Sabbath is the only day blessed by Yahuwah. And it, where is it written that it was changed or annulled, that we may now rather honor the Romans' day of the sun in its place? Oh, it's not written anywhere, is it? Well, why are we doing that? You know, well, that's an interesting question. Oh, there's a cricket up there, yeah. Now, in Psalm 25, 14, this is all just setting you all up for this and seeing the contrast of the world. The secret of Yahuwah is with those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. Now, that's interesting. So who does Yahuwah expect to enjoin to his covenant? Would he like everyone to enjoin to the covenant? Of course, yeah. And... Uh, it says in Yeshayahu or Isaiah 56, and let not the son of a foreigner who has joined himself to Yahuwah speak saying, Yahuwah has certainly separated me from his people, nor let the eunuch say, look, I am a dry tree. So if they say, well, that's for the Jews to obey. We are Christians and we don't have to obey those things. What? You know, there's only one body. Now, receiving, <laughs> receiving the covenant all right, now, 
Israel was standing at the foot of Sinai and they were a mixed multitude of various captive peoples that came out with the descendants of Israel. And they all became one through the water first and then they received the covenant, but they didn't really receive the covenant. They were given the covenant, but they didn't receive it. It was in their, in their head, but it wasn't in their heart. You know? So here we have a picture of Spock uh, doing a Vulcan mind meld saying, fascinating, doctor, you secretly love the Torah because he's perceiving deeper into the man's mind and going, aha, you love this. And that's what Yahuwah wants us to do. He wants us to receive, not just know the commandments. We can't just know the commandments. We've got to fall in love with them because they're the character of Yahusha. That's the one that created us. The scattered tribes will have a, a common bond to Torah. And, of course, that's the living word, which is the living Messiah in us. And that's as they're being restored. So when we run into one that says, I love these commandments, and then suddenly you feel something happening to you, a shift of your whole mind and your whole viewpoint. And that's because you're receiving his mindset. Now, Torah must be welcomed and received. Now, in Acts 17, it's for all men. Truly then, having overlooked these times of ignorance, Elohim now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, having given, given proof of this to all by raising him from the dead. And there's no question, it wasn't Buddha, it wasn't Muhammad, it was Yahushua HaMashiach. Now, 2 Timothy 4 says, Proclaim the word. Be urgent in season and out of season. The word season is referring to those Moedim, or those appointed times, the observances. Reprove, that means to correct and guide lovingly. Warn, appeal with all patience and teaching. For there shall be a time when they shall not bear sound teaching. But according to their own desires, they shall heap up for themselves teachers te tickling the ear. And they shall indeed turn their ears away from the truth, that's the Torah, and be turned aside to myths. And here's a few myths down here. You know, the little bunny rabbit, the pumpkin, Santa Claus, all those are myths. And they're just nice little things that people embrace. Now, uh, at one point, we have to understand who we are and identify our birthright. Now, uh, all the tribes of Israel are under, you know, we have a birthright, but the firstborn blessing was actually placed upon one of those tribes, and that was the tribe of Ephraim. The right hand of Yisrael crossed over, even though his son, Yosef, brought these two children of his to the, you know, these two children were the descendants of a, of a Mitzrayimian or an Egyptian girl, he placed the older one on his right hand, but he reached over and put the blessing of the firstborn on the younger son, Ephraim. Okay, that's interesting. A treasure. That treasure is in that blessing. And it has been entrusted into all the scattered tribes of Israel and the restoration of all things is now upon us, and then Yahushua will return. It is our birthright. And I'm not saying that these people, are the Menasha and the Yahudim, the Yahudim are the descendants of the royal priest, uh, I mean the royal uh, line. And the priests come from the Levitical line, or the Levitical line. So you have all these people, and way marks were left all over the world. Like in uh, Europe, the Danube River was named after Dan, the tribe of Dan, and of course uh, Denmark, Dan's land. London is actually called the abode of Dan. London, you, 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 you hear the word all the time. You don't even realize normally that you're hearing the name of Dan. You know, it's all over. Um, and we could go on on that subject on another time maybe. Now the servants and, and, the, and the soldiers and the, and the wedding feast itself is described right here. Now these are all about the festivals. And this parable illustrates some components that maybe we can learn something from. 
in Matthew 22, we read the words of Yahushua. He says, the reign of the heavens is like a man, a sovereign, who made a wedding feast for his son. Now, we can identify the wedding feast as being, you know, the la after the last days and this gathering that is going to happen when Christians say we're going to be in heaven. Well, actually, we're going to be on the earth. But the wedding feast is one of those things that all of this is built up to. And his son, of course, would be Yahushua. Okay? And he sent out his servants, and those would be the prophets, to call all those who were invited to the wedding feast. But they would not come. In other words, they weren't observant. Again, he sent out other servants. Later, he sent out more prophets and teachers. And, they, and he said, say to those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle are, are slaughtered and all is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they disregarded it and went their way this one to his field and that one to his trade. In other words, they were getting distracted by the things of the world or other religious feel, uh, faiths. And the rest, having seized his servants, insulted and killed them. But when the sovereign heard, he was wroth and sent out his soldiers and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. And then he said to his servants, the wedding feast indeed is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Now, that city that was burned could well have been, you know, the city of Jerusalem. Therefore, go into the street corners, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding feast. And those servants went out into the street corners, and they preached, they gathered, they called all whom they found, both wicked and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. And when the sovereign came to view all the guests, he saw there a man who had not put on a wedding garment. In other words, he was not re he was just there, but he wasn't ready. He he's going to have he's one of those bad fish that's going to have to be thrown out because he wasn't observant. Because he looked Yahuwah looks into your heart and knows what your motives are. And he said to him, "Friend, how did you come in here not having a wedding garment?" And he was speechless. Then the sovereign said to the, to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and throw him out into the outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So the observances or the festivals foreshadow redemption and the invitation to the wedding feast is heard in the call to observe the festivals of Yahuwah. So we're being called back to those festivals out of the things that are nonsense. You know, the bus that we were riding on before, we jumped off of it. And now we're observing the truth and we're calling back to those people still on the bus. Now the invitation to the wedding feast is first given to those invited in this text. Leviticus 23, or Waikra 23, verses 1 through 3. And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Yisrael. And say to them, the appointed times of Yahuwah, which you are to proclaim as Kodesh Mikra. Kodesh means a set apart or special. Mikra means a proclamation. It's, a, it's proclaimed. My appointed times are these. He starts off with this one is the first one. Six days work is done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath Sabbathon, a Kodesh Mikra. You do no work. It is a Sabbath rest to Yahuwah in all your dwellings. The word Kodesh means dedicated. Uh, Sabbathon means an affirmative command to rest. And Mikra is a calling. Okay? You can look those words up. You know, it's right here on the screen in a concordance. That's where I got the definitions. Leviticus 23 continues in verse 4 saying, and this is another level because the first level starts off with the weekly Sabbath. Now we've got to go with the moon to determine these festivals. These are the appointed times of Yahuwah, Kodesh Mikra, which you are to proclaim at their appointed times. In the first moon or month, on the 14th day of the month, between the evenings is the Passover to Yahuwah. 
And on the 15th day of this month is the festival of unleavened bread to Yahuwah. Now those are just a day apart, see? There's an observance and then there's another observance. Seven days you eat unleavened bread. On the first day you have a Kodesh Mikra and you do no servile work. Now that means you don't go out and earn money. And you don't cause anybody else to do that either. So you don't go to the store and buy anything, you know. And you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahuwah for seven days. And that's, of course, the priesthood had to do that. On the seventh day is a Kodesh Mikra, and you do no servile work. So it's a, a day that you rest. You rest on the 15th day, and then you rest on the seventh day from that point. So the 15th day of the moon is, a, is a, an annual Sabbath, and then seven days from then is another annual Sabbath. And Pesach is the first one. Of course, that's not a day of rest, but it's an observance. And then we've got the festival of matzah. And then we've got a festival called First Fruits, which we're going to look at. Don't worry about that. That's uh, reflecting Yahushua's <coughs> resurrection. It's called Bikurim. Now, Shabuoth, which is the commemoration of the giving of the Torah at Sinai, and Yom Teruah, which is the day of the shout, and it will not be anything like this. It'll be a lot louder. That's a horn. <laughs> yom Kafar, the day of the covering. The word Yom means day, okay? Sukkoth means tents or booths. Now, these are seven events and they're conditional elements. It's highly conditional. We accept our by our participation in them binding us in a marriage relationship at a future wedding feast. If we're not his bride, we will not know anything about these things, and a lot of people don't. So if we're going to be, expect to be his bride, we better know about these things that are about the wedding feast. And it's a marriage that is despised by the dragon. He doesn't want you to know. He's created other belief systems for you to be distracted by. Now, Yisrael did ignore the Torah, and for that was scattered abroad twice, actually three times if you count the northern tribes expelled from their Sumerian area, or Shomeron. Their city was burned, and here we have in the Arch of Titus in Rome, this is actually a building in Rome that is a big archway, and inside the arch there's a picture of the booty and things that were taken away from the Yahudim. And one of them is an actual picture of what the menorah really looked like. And it's said that it's down in the catacombs now in Rome. They actually have that thing. Of course, they're keeping all the things they have down there secret. It's like a treasure trove. And uh, anyway, that's an actual picture of the conquering of the city of Jerusalem in 70 CE. The menorah is carried away by the Roman army. Now, Due to disobedience, all Yisrael has been scattered to live among the Gentiles until the restoration of all things. You can look at Acts 3.21 for that. And that's going to happen, and then Yahushua is going to return. Their rejection of Torah produced bitterness, but their Redeemer knew that they would, once again, seek him in the last days. And you know that because Deuteronomy 4, verse 30, describes everything for us about the scattering and then the regathering. Amos 5, 7 says, O you who are turning right ruling into wormwood and have cast down righteousness to the earth. Now, Yeshayahu or Isaiah 48 says, Thus said Yahuwah, your Redeemer, the set-apart one of Israel. I highlighted that, word, that phrase. The set-apart one of Israel. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim teaching you what is best, leading you by the way you should go. If only you had listened to my commands. That's odd to read that when you're hearing all this other programming that we're not to obey. Because, you know, what, it's legalism to obey. Well, it is good to be legal. Anyway, Deuteronomy 29, verse 19 says, And it shall be when he hears the words of this curse that he should bless himself in his heart, saying, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, in order to add drunkenness to thirst. 
In other words, people are given the, uh, the programming that programs their conscience such that they don't care. They say, well, he still loves me. I, I don't have to know what his name is. He knows who I mean. Or I don't have to worry about what day to rest during the week. <laughs> well, that's error is what it is. And the, their consciousness, their consciences are, instead of warning them like a warning si system, are, they're all, the wiring is all messed up. Now, it's interesting to note here that Yahuwah's own, identif he identifies himself and it involves his relationship to his wife in this text. He says, your redeemer, the set apart one of Israel. So he relates himself in a relationship, even in, in a, his own identity. Set apart one of Israel. And Israel is a man, but it's also all of his descendants that are scattered into all the nations. Their seed is just mixed in thoroughly. That's Yahuwah's own wife. You know, and you should comprehend your birthright to know who you are. And this picture over here of the woman meeting Yahusha at the well, that's in John 4, or, you know, Yahukan in chapter 4. And the woman represents Yisrael, and Yahusha is the husband, and he's calling her back to himself. She had five other, other husbands, and those are the false husbands. He's the real husband, and, you know, he's trying to call that. It's an example. It's a small picture of that. Now, Yermiyahu 9, or Jeremiah, says this, And Yahuwah says, Because they have forsaken my Torah, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it, but they have walked according to the stubbornness of their own heart, and after the B-A-A-L-I-M, the Lord's, which their fathers had taught them. Therefore, thus said Yahuwah of hosts, the Elohim of Yisrael, see that? He's the Elohim of Israel. See, I am making this people eat wormwood, and I shall make them drink poison water. Those are false doctrines, because wormwood, according to Amos, is changing right ruling into wormwood. And I shall scatter them among the Gentiles, whom they nor their fathers have known, and I shall send a sword after them until I have consumed them. Now the dragon and the circus fathers hate Israel. And they hate Torah, and they hate the marriage covenant because the dragon hates all those things. So who's running the world? The dragon. And we see here people saying, back to the 67 borders. Let's blow them up. Let's drive them out of there. Everybody's been doing it. You know, the Nazis, everybody. You know, the Arabs. When they're supposed to enjoin to the covenant too. Now, the new laws that were enacted in 186 BCE by the Greek invader called Antiochus Epiphanes, said, you shall profane the Sabbath. The, the Sabbath, you shall prof profane it. You shall engage, in, you shall change the times, the set times and laws. And if you look at Daniel 7.25, you'll see that he did change the set times and Constantine did too. You shall set up idols and you shall eat unclean animals, and you shall not circumcise, and you shall forget Torah. Well, I've got a picture of an individual here, no judgment on her, but her and her type, they don't have a problem with any of those things. Setting up idols, that's not a problem. And uh, here's Second Timothy 3 says, having a form of reverence, but denying its authority or its power, and turn away from these, so if you see something that's in conflict with what Yahuwah said it is written, then you should look again and say, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Antiochus Epiphany set up an image of Zeus in the temple. And the reason I spell those words is because I'm dismembering them. Because in Exodus or Shemot chapter 23, verse 13, it says, do not take the names of other Elohim upon your lips. So we don't talk about those lips. I mean, on our lips. Constantine would, would later repeat this pattern. And this has been passed down through the various denominations of Christianity. Maybe not every one of them. Uh, they, uh, many of the denominations don't set up idols, but uh, they do observe the day of the sun, you know, and they do eat ham, you know, unclean animals. Anyway, because they're the daughters, the offspring of these uh, teachings. All the followers of the Yahudim, Yahusha, Hamashiach, 
who wished to become a member of the Christian community were compelled to adopt the new set of rules and customs. Creeds were drafted to which the new Christian would have to swear. And this is all part of that. You can read about that. We've already had this in the Wormwood uh, seminar, so you can go back and look at that one too. So they were dispersed. The Yahudim and all the Israelites were sent into the nations. And they were ejected a number of times. They were ejected from the Garden of Eden in 4004 BCE. Not the Israelites, but, you know, people who disobeyed. Our first parents were, dis were ejected. That was, uh, you know, the first time we were thrown out of something. And then we were ejected from Shomeron in 722 BCE, and probably for decades before that too. But uh, the final blow came in 722 or 721, when the Assyrians carried away the 10 tribes and dispersed them. And they, most of them ran for their lives by sea or by land. But that's a dispersal or an ejection. And then later in 586 BCE, Nebuchadnezzar came and took away and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple. So, you know, Israel, uh, Yehuda was ejected. So we have Israel, the ten tribes, and we have Yehuda ejected. And then we see another ejection in 70 CE under Titus. So there's four right there. Now, the messengers of light are described in the text here in uh, 2 Corinthians 11. For such are false emissaries, deceptive workers, masquerading as emissaries of Messiah. And no wonder for Hashatan himself, or Satan himself, masquerades as a messenger of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So these types of people that are actually masquerading are actually warlocks. You know, they're wizards. And if we're consulting wizards, and that's what they did in the Wizard of Oz, they consulted the wizard. <laughs> and listening to warlocks and uh, people like that will guide you away from the truth. And if you're following sacraments, then, you know, that's something made up because that's not anything in the scriptures. Now, Yeshayahu 8, 19 and 20 say, and when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their, equal, their, their Elohim? In other words, you shouldn't pray to dead people, you know, or go to people to contact the dead. Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the Torah and to the witness, if they do not speak according to this word, that's the Torah, <clears throat> then it's because they have no daybreak. Here's some people over here kneeling down to a statue, and they don't have any problem doing that because their consciences are seared as with a hot iron. Here's some people kneeling down to a statue. It's a picture of one of the papists, a, a pope, and they're kneeling down to it and bowing to it and praying. And they're praying to this object. <clears throat> I've got this word arcane hui up here, which is kind of a fun little phrase. Arcane means something that's mysterious and hidden, and hui would be just sad, ridiculous stuff, you know. And are you doing uh, hidden, ridiculous stuff, or is this mass hypnosis? But I'm thinking both are probably true. Now, if it seems evil in your eyes to serve Yahuwah, choose for yourselves that this day whom you are going to serve whether the mighty ones which your father served that were beyond the river or the mighty ones of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but I and my house, we serve Yahuwah. Now that's from Yahusha chapter 24, verse 15. Now the Constantine Creed, we covered that in a Wormwood seminar just a, a while back, but uh, this is really arcane hui because it's talking about abandoning all the things that we just were told to obey. Now we're going to see the contrast between what man's religions have taught, taught us right up against the word. Now there's a plan of redemption and that redemption is reflected in the seven festivals. Deuteronomy 4 says, And Yahuwah shall scatter you among the peoples and you shall be left few in number among the Gentiles where Yahuwah drives you. And there you shall serve mighty ones, the work of men's hands, like we just saw wood and stone, which neither see 
nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But from there you shall seek Yahuwah, your Elohim, and shall find him, or find, when you search for him with all your heart and with all your being. In your distress, when all these words shall come upon you in the latter days, then you shall return to Yahuwah, your Elohim, and shall obey his voice. For Yahuwah your Elohim is a compassionate El. He does not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore to them. For ask now of the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that Elohim created man on the earth, and ask for, from one end of the heavens to the other end of the heavens, whether there has been a word as great as this, or has been heard like it. Now, overcoming deception, we have uh, people saying that, you know, we're going to be uh, raptured and then the people that are left are going to have to go through the great distress. Well, there's going to be Sabbath keepers during the great distress. You know, now a lot of people make up in, in their own minds that, well, these people are going to be, uh, well, if the real Kakadesh is removed from the earth, how are they going to learn about the Sabbath? Well, the fact is, we're going to still be here. Anyway, the Sabbath keepers are going to remain here during the great distress. And it says here in Matthew 24, verses 20 through 27, And pray that your flight does not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there shall be great distress, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. He's talking to us. And if those days were not shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the sake of the chosen ones that are still on the earth, those days shall be shortened. If anyone then says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there, do not believe. For false messiahs and false prophets shall arise, and they shall show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray if possible, even the chosen ones. See, I, am forewarned, I have forewarned you. So, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines to the west, so also shall the coming of the son of Adam be. Now, the deception is seen right here in these two illustrations. We've got words of men, and we've got Yahuwah's word. Now let's see what they say, just for the fun of it. Because our, some of these people say that their authority is above scripture. They're on record saying that. That comes from these Nicolaitans. Now the observances of, of Yahuwah, the first one is called the Sabbath. That's the first observance that Yahuwah says, these are my apart, appointed times, the Sabbath. It's a weekly thing. Now the the Catechetical School of Alexandria decrees from the Council of Laodicea in 364, maybe 365, it's kind of hard to tell. Christians must not Judaize. That means to live as a Yehudi. That's what Judaize actually means, to live as a Yehudi by resting on the Sabbath. They must not Judaize or must not live as Yehudim by resting on the Sabbath. They just recognize the Sabbath. Rather, but must work on that day. So they're referring to the Sabbath, and they're saying, but must work on that day. You know, what did Yahuwah say about that? Well, rather, honoring the Lord's day, but if any shall be found to be Judaizers, that is, people who live as the Yahudim, let them be anathema, from Christ. Now, here's the contrast. This is what Yahuwah says through the prophet Yeshayahu, one of those servants that went out to call. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it, guarding the Sabbath, lest he profane it, and guarding his hand from doing any evil. Now, is he a masquerading messenger of the of the adversary? Is that who I, Yeshayahu is? Or is this counsel? You decide. It's right there. There's the Sabbath, and there's the Sabbath. These people are saying to profane the Sabbath. They have to work 
on that day. Well, there you go. You know, it's not good. I'm not condemning individuals. I'm just condemning or showing the doctrines that are taught. Now, the definition of some original words that we used earlier, moedim is a Hebrew word that means appointed times. It's a plural word. The I am makes it plural. And many of them are festivals or feasts and commemorates uh, or shadows how Mashiach Yehusha is redeeming his wife, Yisrael. The shadows picture redemption. And they're given at Leviticus 23 and again at Deuteronomy 16, or Debarim 16. Now, the word Abib is, is a name that's given to the first moon of the year. Abib is a, is a Hebrew word that means grain. It means grain. It doesn't mean something is just a little nub. It means it's ready to be harvested. It's ripe. It's like your grass. If you let your grass grow for about two weeks, it'll go to seed. It takes about two weeks. You'll see little seeds popping up, and they're ready to go. They'll actually make more grass. Well, barley is just like that. It grows real fast. Anyway, it means grain. It doesn't mean green. First moon of the year. This is not a day of rest, but only the first day of the first moon. In the spring of the new year, it's past the equinox, or within the equinox, because the equinox can happen, you know, and when that, it, it, can, it doesn't have to actually, it can actually be a few days before the equinox, you know, and if it, it, because it's in a, in, a, in a mode there. This is referring to spring in the northern hemisphere. Now let's look at the annual feast, which is our birthright. This is our birthright. We may as well take them. Now the Sabbath is a sign forever. Now this is repeated again in Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and verse 20. The Sabbath in Exodus 31, 13 through 17 says, And you speak to the children of Israel, saying, My Sabbath you are to guard by all means, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations to know that I, Yahuwah, am setting you apart. And you shall guard the Sabbath, for it is set apart to you. Everyone who profanes it shall certainly be put to death. For anyone who does work on it, that being shall be cut off from among his people. And remember, we read the words of the Council of Laodicea, and they said to work on that day. Six days work is done, and on the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, set apart, to Yahuwah. Everyone doing work on the Sabbath day shall certainly be put to death. And the children of Israel shall guard the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. In fact, it is the sign of the everlasting covenant. And that's what we read in Ezekiel chapter 20. And the children of Israel shall guard the Sabbath. Between me and the children of Israel, it is a sign forever. For in six days, Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Now, where is it written that the weekly Sabbath is determined by the phase of the moon? It isn't written anywhere. So, oh, there's a the cricket. Anyway, um, the next festival is Pesach. Pesach is the memorial of Yahushua's death. Okay? And he's the Passover lamb. The blood that was put on the lintel and the doorposts were the wounds of the Messiah. And that's a sign that we're to have in our minds. It's, a, it's not an activity we necessarily have to do in terms of putting blood on there, but we are to remember it. We usually use wine and and hyssop or, or parsley or something, and we splatter some wine upon the lintel and the doorposts. And it reminds us of the Messiah and his wounds. It's a preparation day for the annual Sabbath on the 15th of the moon, of the first moon. And Yahushua was impaled during the day part of the 14th of the first moon. And he observed this memorial with his Talmudim or the disciples the evening before at the arrival of the 14th. So we do that too. We at the beginning of the 14th, we have a memorial because that's when he did it. And then we have another one uh, at the first, on the, the next night. And that's, uh, you know, not a problem. Now the festival of unleavened bread is called matzah. And it's a seven day period where we have to get rid of all the leaven in our homes. 
and we don't eat leaven when we're out. And it's the rest, it's a rest day, the first day is, and the seventh day is a rest day. And this shadow picture depicts cleaning out the leaven from our hearts. That's the sin and the false doctrines. Yes? What was leaven bread? Uh, leaven is, is uh, kometz or it's uh, yeast, and that makes the bread rise. We, we eat flat cracker stuff, you know, during that week. And it prepares us to receive. Yeah, you can eat flatbread. It can be it can be soft, like pita bread doesn't have yeast in it, you know, uh, unless you see it in the ingredients, of course. But uh, preparing us to receive this prepares us to receive the good seed of Torah. Fifty days later, at Shabbat. See, we're to get rid of the old leaven. In other words, uh, when when Israel came out of Mitzrayim or Egypt, they were loaded down in their heads and their hearts with all this Egyptian stuff. And they had to get rid of all that in their hearts, you know. But this was a picture, a shadow. Uh, and it commemorates Israel being delivered from slavery after judgment of all the firstborn males in Mitzrayim. Now, the 15th day of the first moon is a full moon every year. And for seven days, all Yisrael is to abstain from leavened bread. And that, that's all believers. Now, the festival of first fruits occurs during that same seven-day period. And it's the, it's the weekly, the, the, the morrow after the weekly Sabbath. So it would be on what we would call the day of the sun. It's the first day of the week in that week. Because the moon determines when the 15th is. And then during that week, there's going to be a weekend, you know, the end of the week. And then the day after that, the first day of the week. And uh, Yahudim do this with... Uh, by determining it from the 16th of Abib, the day after the first day of the, fe of the feast, because they don't have the sign of Yona. And I'll explain that maybe a little later. The wave sheath is where the omer, which is a bundle of barley, and it, it was offered by the high priest, and it's called the first fruits. And they were doing this for centuries, waving this bundle, not knowing what it was all about. And it was fulfilled by Yahushua when he resurrected because his body was the first fruits of many more to come. During the festival of matzah, the high priest would wave the first fruits of the barley harvest on the morrow after the Sabbath. Yahushua became the wave sheath offering because the resurrection was the object that was casting the shadow. The wave sheath was just a shadow. He himself was the object of that, the resurrection. So, for those without the sign of Yonah, this offering is traditionally thought of as being Abib 16, which is the 15th is an annual Sabbath, and then the day after that, which they consider a Sabbath, the day after that is first fruits. But that can happen, but it, it isn't the way it, it, it normally would be. But uh, during the, the week that Yahushua was actually uh, killed, he died on the 14th and was in the tomb on the, on the uh, 15th. And he was still in the tomb on the 16th. <laughs> so the uh, Abib 16, it's certainly not possible for him to be in the tomb and yet be the resurrection too. You, because the resurrection didn't occur until three days and three nights later after that. So Abib 16 is not the correct time to determine as first fruits because it's about the resurrection. And those that don't have that uh, understanding are the people that don't know about Yahushua. Anyway, the count to Shabbat is critical to get for this because you have to go uh, start from that morrow after the Sabbath, that weekly Sabbath, to count, and then Shabbat will always occur on the first day of the week. The seventh day of Matzah is the 21st day of the first moon, and it is a reflection of our immersion. When Israel went through the water, and the Pharaoh's armies were destroyed. The last day of Matzah commemorates the passing through the water of Yisrael and a mixed multitude of other captives passing through the waters, all delivered. Immersion into Moshe is what it's referred to, and drowning of the armies of Pharaoh. And this is a shadow of our own immersion into life through the calling upon the name of Yahushua and identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection. And we're joined to the commonwealth of Yisrael as one body sharing in the covenants. And if you read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 13, it's very easy to understand this. We were formerly Gentiles in the flesh, but we're not Gentiles anymore. Once we've gone through the water, we've turned into an Israelite. 
Shabuoth is the 50th day from the morrow after that Sabbath during matzah. And it's Hebrew, and it means weeks. It's plural. Shabu, Shabuah means week. Shabuoth means weeks. And they're real weeks. They're not just groups of seven days. They're actual weeks. Seven complete Sabbaths. And it commemorates the giving of the Torah, the giving of the Torah, not the receiving, <laughs> because the receiving didn't happen until Acts chapter 2, when the Nazarene had it written on their hearts. Now, it was at Sinai, and this is a wedding anniversary, it's not a birthday, it's a commemoration. Anyway, at Sinai, and this uh, wedding anniversary of Yahuwah and Israel, and Torah, it, it just simply means instructions. And the instructions were given to the wife. The covenant is a marriage. That's what it is. Traditionally, it's called Pentecost. That's a Greek word that means count 50. Penta means five, or I mean 50. And kos means to count. So anyway, Greek is probably not the way to go. We need to go with the real word. So. It was fulfilled, as recorded in Acts chapter 2, when Torah was written on the hearts of the Nazarene. And that was a fulfillment of the prophecy in Yermiyahu, or Jeremiah chapter 31. Renewing the covenant, restoring Israel to Yahuwah through indwelling of Yahushua's spirit. And it's not a birthday, it's a wedding anniversary. Anyway, it's calculated from the weekly Sabbath during Matzah, counting seven Sabbaths to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, the morrow after, being the 50th day. And the Yahudim always calculate from Abib 16. But that's because they don't have the sign of Yonah, you know. So it was received in Acts chapter 2. And then, uh, this is an interesting text to quote too. And this is part fulfillment because this was quoted by Kepha when he stood up and explained it in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 3. And after this, it shall be that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men dream dreams, and your young men see visions. That was awesome. Now, Yom Teruah is the next festival. And it's, remember, Yom means day. Teruah means to shout. And it's associated with the shout of a, of a shofar. You know, something a bit bigger than this. Yom Teruah is the day of the shout. It's the first day of the seventh moon, okay? When we hear a shofar blown, we're supposed to go and hear a shofar blown or blow one so that we're reminding ourselves of something that's ahead because it's a shadow of something coming. And it's going to be a huge day. It's going to be representing something here. It's the coming day of the resurrection of the dead. This trumpet is going to, the, arc, the great trumpet of the great messenger is going to blow, and the dead are going to be raised. <laughs> First, when the voice of a great messenger shouts like a trumpet, the last trump is what it's referred to, and it's still unfulfilled, and it foreshadows things to come. The first resurrection begins the thousand year reign at the coming of Yahushua. Now that's pretty exciting. Now the second resurrection. We have a, a whole seminar on the two resurrections. And the second resurrection will be at the great white, white throne judgment a thousand years later. Now, Yom Kafar is another festival. And it's a very solemn festival. It's not really a festival. It's more of a Sabbath of Sabbaths. It's uh, not a, a day that you eat. It's a day that you afflict your beings. And it's a day of covering. It's a Sabbath of Sabbaths. It's the 10th day of the seventh moon. And it uh, reminds us of a scroll of life and the redemption of the living. Following the raising of the dead, which occurred on the first day of the seventh moon, the first fruits group who are still alive will be changed in the wink of an eye and clothed with immortality. Isn't that going to be a day? <laughs> wow. We're going to see some awesome things if we're alive during these times. We shouldn't be afraid. He said he's warned us. So. And now Sukkoth is a Hebrew word that means booths or tents. Uh, tabernacles is more of a, a Latin word. And it's Yahushua's real day of birth. The first day of, this, of, of, of Sukkoth is the 15th day of the seventh moon. That's the day that Yahushua was really born. 
And he was circumcised on the eighth day, the last great day. Now it's the 15th day of the seventh moon when it arrives, and it's when Yahushua tabernacled among us as Emmanuel. That means Elohim is with us. And it's often referred to as tents or booths. And it reminds us of Israel living in tents for 40 years. But it looks forward, or as a shadow, of the actual wedding feast. And we talked about that earlier. And it's the return of Yahushua, because he's returning for his bride. The, uh, he's actually the uh, husband of Israel. Now, it's on the day of Yahuwah, following the great tribulation and the annihilation of the unrighteous at his return. It's the, the, the closing day of the festival is a day of rest, and it is the day that Yahushua was circumcised on. And it's the 22nd day of the seventh moon. It's also called the last great day. This, the, it's the day that he was actually circumcised. Anyway, I've got a little picture up here of Yosef, or Yusuf, Yahushua, and Miriam. And that was the day, the fir, that was the 15th of the seventh moon when he was actually born. And of course, the, the shepherds were made aware of it that night. But the Magi from, you know, Babylon, they didn't show up for two years. <laughs> they didn't come that night. And uh, we put up a sukkah every year because someone is coming. Someone's coming. And that's uh, a very important thing because that reflects another thing. Because in the Jewish wedding ceremonies, we have what we call a kupa, which is exactly like that. And we also call this a sukkah. So the wedding kupa is going to be very appropriate. And the ones that are doing that are going to be prepared because they're, they're his wife. They know what, what's going on. Isn't that exciting? So we're to repent for the day for the reign of Yahuwah draws near. And Yahuwah says in Zephaniah 3, No longer need you fear evil. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands be weak. Yahuwah, your Elohim, is in your midst, is mighty to save. He rejoices over you with joy. He is silent in his love. He rejoices over you with singing. So I shall gather those who grieve about the appointed place who are, who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. See, I am, dwelling, or I am dealing with all those afflicting you at that time. And I shall save the lame and gather those who were cast out. And I shall give them for a praise and for a name in all the earth where they were put to shame. At that time I shall bring you in, even at the time I gather you. For I shall give you for a name and for a praise among all the peoples of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, said Yahuwah. And all flesh shall know that I, Yahuwah, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Elohim of Yaakov. Yahusha is coming soon for his bride, and the bride is Israel. You've got to engraft. And as uh, Nazarim, this is what we're, our, we're commissioned to do. We're commissioned to go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Set-Apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. And that's what he said to Moshe's successor. Now, uh, distilled to its essential points, we're to teach them the name, and we are to teach them the Torah of Yahuwah. And that's essentially it. So if we keep the covenant burning, it's obvious that we'll be in the, the his bride. Did you have a question? No? Hey, that's the end of the seminar, but uh, it took an hour and 15 minutes. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people were asking me about this uh, subject, you know. Tell me about the festivals. What about, what about the feasts of Yahuwah? What am I supposed to know about those? Well, it's, it's about redemption. And it's nothing that we necessarily have to do, but we have to recognize what our husband is doing and, and will be doing. He has done, and he is doing, and he will be doing. So it's, uh, it's an amazing thing. It's like the core you know, of understanding. It's, these festivals are all done away with by the Christian, Christian uh, organization.